In this episode of Revenue Harvest, I get the pleasure of sitting down with Lisa McLeod. I first read her book, Selling with Noble Purpose, back in 2013. At the time, I was leading a healthcare sales team, and we had good people on the sales team, but there was just something missing about the profile that left me wondering if we had the right people. Although they were good people, I wondered if they were the right people. I read her book and I realized that we were missing a few really key components in our ideal sales rep profile, and we're going to get into that in this episode. Lisa has a lot of great free content on LinkedIn about selling, about nobility of selling, about leading sales teams and I think you're gonna love everything that she has to say. She's got some new data that she's gonna share with us. So let's jump into the conversation. Lisa Earl McLeod. Lisa, welcome to Revenue Harvest. I'm glad to be here. I love the name, Revenue Harvest. It's so bountiful. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, I I tell people, um, well, it's a problem in sales leadership for for, for me. And and Part of the reason why I wrote the book and, and named the podcast Revenue Harvest is that, so I live in a farming community, and if you don't produce a crop, you're just not a farmer. Like, if you don't put hay in the barn, what's it all about? And there are so many sales leaders that just don't put hay in the barn. <laughs> Love a good old country boy analogy. Yeah. So this, I'm really excited about this, uh, and we I wish I could have recorded this earlier, but we were, we were this is the first time we've ever met, and I told you I'm kind of a fanboy because I read your work uh, early in my sales leadership career, and it was one of this like indelible aha moments for me that I always had this belief that I couldn't put language around about the role that purpose, uh, and more specifically, the purpose attached to the company's offering you represent and how it can make you better than your contemporaries. And this book, uh, Selling a Noble Purpose, is, and it's, it's a classic book by, at this point, it's almost 10 years old, but I love it. And I, it's one of my most recommended books. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you. And remind me to send you the new updated version, which we have. Oh, I can't wait. So the book and the hook for me was you did this double blind study, and I think it was over 10,000 sellers, but I'm just going to stop there and say, tell me, tell me the conclusion of this study. So here's the number one thing that people need to know. We studied a large team of salespeople. This is where Selling with Noble Purpose was born. And what we found was that the top performers, the thing that was common to the top performers, was they had a sense of what we called noble purpose. And what I mean by that is their aim, their true north, why they woke up every day was to improve the lives of their customers. And what was interesting was this sits underneath sales skills. And it was a discovery that I made through, because I'm a curious person, through the interviews. When I observed their sales calls, the difference between the exceptional performers and the good performers was a little more nuanced. The exceptional performers asked more questions. They asked deeper questions. They paid better attention to body cues. There were lots of small things. And those are the things we try and teach in sales training. But when I dug beneath what I found, what was driving those things was this overriding sense of purpose. It's like the difference between a teacher who thinks his job is to teach the history lesson versus a teacher who thinks my job is to create informed citizens. Now, we all know which class you would rather be in and which class you'd rather have your child in. And what we found over time, that first study was the tipping point. This noble purpose is the differentiator for top performers. But what we found over time is it can actually be taught to everyone else. So it's not a technique, but it can be taught. It can be taught. And there's a number of techniques, if you will, that sit on top of that. It's just like if you want to be the best parent in the world or the best teacher in the world, fill in the best doctor in the world, and you really want to change lives, improve lives, there are techniques that will help you get better when you have that ethos. But the challenge in sales in most organizations is the ethos actually erodes a sense of noble purpose. 
Because instead of standing up at the sales meeting saying, let's talk about how we're going to improve our customers' lives, the leader is talk, standing up saying, well, let's talk about how we're going to hit our number and crush our competition. They're not bad mm. people. They're trying to do a good job. But if I'm a seller and I go into a sales interaction with the thought, I'm here to crush the competition, I'm here to hit my number, I'm not going to be as effective as if I go into the sales interaction thinking, how can I improve life for my customer? And I have a, I need a very deep understanding of how I can do that. So I, I want to come back to this about the sales leader's responsibility and the ethos. But before I do, have you found that it's easier for a sales leader to go to the market and find someone that has this purpose or to train it within the existing team? Um, in my experience... So here's, here's what the data tells us. There's a certain percentage of people that are going to be purpose-driven. And if you get them in your company, they will be your top performers. If there is a sense of purpose present in your company. If they don't find it, they'll leave and they'll go somewhere else. So what we're seeing now is the best people, you need that sense of purpose to attract them. Like the best people are going to be sitting in your interview going, so how does your company make a difference? How do you improve life for people? And you don't have to change the world. You can be an accounting firm that helps people sleep at night. But the best people are going to be attracted to it. Having said that, it's not present for most people on a daily basis. And you can absolutely train to it. Because, again, it's just like that teacher or parent. I got into this because I wanted to make a difference. And then the grind comes in and I forget. And so one of the fundamental jobs of leadership is to point people towards that true and noble purpose as the true north. The numbers matter, but the numbers are a lagging indicator. The numbers are reflective of the beliefs and behavior of your sales team. And you can train for belief and behavior. So there's like this prevailing thought that you have to believe in what you sell. But this seems like it's different. Uh, this is slightly different. You do have to believe in what you sell, but it's the job of leadership to build that belief. The leader is the belief builder. And so I'm probably not going to be successful if I was doing sales training for, I don't know, a tobacco company because I don't believe. You know, it's a legal product. If that's what you want to do. You're on your own for that. But we have worked, we've worked with a concrete company, an accounting firm. Uh, I mean, people in all sorts of different experiences and, and with different solutions. And so a lot of times what happens is the sellers don't see how they make a difference. We worked with an IT support company and they were like, yeah, you know, we just help small businesses with their IT. We started pulling in customers and saying, where were you before you started working with this company? Where were you now? And customers started saying things like, oh my gosh, this used to be the knot in my stomach. This used to be the thing I worried about and now they just handle it and they handle it so well. And so they ended up with the noble purpose. We help small businesses be more successful. Like, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but from where I sit, that is a true and noble purpose. So you're looking for that wonderful mix of people who are interested in you is to become sellers for you because they think, oh, this really does make a difference. And also, as leaders, you've got to articulate it and reinforce it on a daily basis. But the, but the noble purpose isn't enough, right? And we talked about this before yeah. we got on, we went live. And I want to I want to go back to this because I think it can be a trap for some yes. leaders. If, if you if you're interviewing a candidate and they are super like so for for some offerings out there, and we were talking specifically about um, my past and representing a company that's that owned and operated addiction treatment centers. So it is very easy for anyone listening to this to understand how you might be interviewing someone for a role that's passionate about recovery. That can be a trap if you have an offering that's really easy for a candidate to be passionate about. And what what are some of those traps? So here's the thing you need to know. Passion and purpose are two different things. Passion means I care deeply about this and I'm interested in it. Purpose means I know it makes a difference to other people. And if you have to choose between passion, passionate and purposeful people are the top performers. No passion, no purpose, poor performers. But purpose-driven people actually outperform the passion people because passion is very 
personal. It's about me. So for example, I could be passionate and I am about what some of these medical companies are doing. I don't have the skills. I don't have the science. I'm not, that, that's not going to work. So I'm not going to be able to go out and represent them. So what you're looking for is more than just, I'm excited about your offering. Because if I'm excited, I'm going to go talk to everybody and say, this is the best thing since sliced bread, blah, 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 blah. What I need to be purposeful about is how it improves life for the customer. And I need to show that I have the sales discipline to go out and ask customers a lot of questions and figure out what's going on with them and figure out how this thing I'm passionate about fits in with them. Because just the passion, like I went to a party last week with a guy who was passionate about his take on politics. And I'm sorry, it was really damn boring because he didn't ask me a single question. All he did was talk. That's not what you want in a seller. What you want in a seller is you want someone who cares about how this thing impacts others. Because you've got to have that other orientation, not just how excited I am about it for me. And so you've got to have that sales discipline because what we say is that the purpose is the core. It is the beating heartbeat. It is the drumbeat. It is the driver. You've got to sit some sales skills on top of that, which we all know can be taught. You don't have to be a raging extrovert. You don't have to be Mr. Personality. You need to have some sales skills around the sales discipline around uh, discovery conversations, around the discipline to put together a proposal that reflects the customer's issues. I mean, all those things, just me being excited about it's not enough. So let's take what you said about the, the ability to communicate how this impacts others. And let's go, let's take that and go back to the sales leader, because one of the things that you wrote in the book is that you said, hey, sales leaders, if you want your reps to communicate your offering to their customers in a compelling way, you need to communicate with your sales force in a compelling way. That's right. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's do a before and after, okay? Imagine you're my sales rep, and I say to you, Well, Nigel, the most important thing is to hit your number. I need you to hit that number. You got it? Look me eyeball to eyeball. You're a beast. I'm going to hit the number. It's it's true. I mean, it it is. It's the most important thing. But. And now imagine I say, tell me about this deal you've got on the table. Who's the, what are the questions I'm going to ask? When's it going to close? How big is it going to be? Who's the competition? Do you have all the decision makers in the room? What's the budget? Okay. All of those things matter. But if I've done that to you as a seller, I haven't prepared you to go have a conversation with customers. Instead, what I want to be saying, I'm going to give you two things you can say. When we're talking collectively, I want to be saying our goal this year is to help 10,000 customers. And Nigel, you're going to help a thousand of them. You go, we're going to help a thousand customers. So I still got the number, but I've reoriented the frame. Then when we're talking about your deal on the table, so sales managers, if you're listening to this, I'm going to give you the game-changing question. If you take nothing else away from this conversation, take this. I'm going to ask you, when are you going to close it? How much is it going to be? Decision makers, all that. This is the question that will reorient your rep. How will this customer be different as a result of doing business with us? I just took that rep's mind. Well, you tell me. I, I, I recruited you as my sales rep. Where'd your mind go when I asked that question? It, it went deeper. Like I, I had to think about, okay, who's their customer? What's dysfunctional about the way they're serving their customer? Did I, do I even know what the barriers are internally that exist for them to operate as a, as a business? Like how am I adding value to this, right. this whole deal? Your whole brain went to the customer. Yeah. Not just the customer, what's the budget, who's the competition, but it went to the impact you're having. And so as a sales manager, when I ask that question, we call it the driving question, the game-changing question, how will the customer be different as a result of doing business with us? If you can't answer that to me as a rep, you're not prepared to go make the case to the customer. It's very unlikely that you're going to win the business because you're going to be very transactionalized. But because in order to say, how will the customer be different? 
I have to have some knowledge of the customer. I have to have done some discovery or at least have some baseline knowledge, you know, based on my own, you know, business intelligence. And I have to be able to articulate, not just, oh, well, they'll have our stuff and they'll be happier. No. How will they be different? And to your point, it could be they have a problem I'm solving. They could be they're great and they have an opportunity to be better. It it could be any of those things. But that's what we find is it's a reorientation. And the numbers, again, are the lagging indicator. They are the measurement of how well you are solving problems, helping customers move forward. It's just like if I if you were a figure skater and I said to you, well, Nigel, you need to get a better score. Go do it again and get a better score. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> we need to unpack those turns and jumps you're doing because we need to get those a little bit better here. So let, let's take the, let, let's sit with this for a second with sales leaders because a lot of what I see is, um, particularly around change management, whether it be a new comp plan, uh, integrating two sales teams into one, uh, Mm -hmm. making people come back to the office at some point. It seems like sales leaders can probably use this this same line of inquisition or the same level of discovery that they might ask of a rep uh, to prepare them to go talk to a customer to prepare them to address the team. That's exactly right. So when you, we've got a chapter in the new version of Selling with Noble Purpose. As someone who speaks at a lot of conferences, I get to sit through the run-up to when they introduce me. Boring. (laughs) So boring so much of the time. So boring. Because here's what it amounts to is, here's the numbers, either yay or oh my, Here's the numbers that we produced this year. Here's, you know, how we want to make more money next year. Blah, 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 blah. Everybody already knows that. And so instead, what the leaders want to be doing is they want to be saying, here's how we made a difference to our customers. Because I'm trying to build belief deep, and I could go into the neuroscience of this, but I'm trying to get deep down into your lizard brain and your brainstem. <laughs> and if I'm just saying, here's the comp plan, how you got to make more money this year, I'm activating the worst part of you. But in that meeting, if I'm saying things like, here's how we make a difference to customers. Here are some real life examples. Let's bring one in and she's going to talk about how we made a difference. Right now, we know that our total addressable market is XYZ. There's 10,000 more people out here just like her. That's what we're focused on. And so it's a very different orientation. And one leader that I work with who's a COO of a major hotel chain, he said, I am shocked by how adding two or three sentences to everything that I report and framing it in the context of making a difference to customers, he said, within a year, we've created a completely different team. We're unstoppable. Because what you're trying to do is seed in your people a language in them that will differentiate them in the marketplace. And it's not necessarily that they're repeating your language, but you're trying to seed in them a belief about why we're here. And so Uh, There's a great piece that uh, I say great. Well, I thought it was great because I wrote it that we wrote for Harvard Business Review about financial targets don't motivate people. And what happens in so many leadership capacities is people get some version of you are a cog in our money machine. Do your part. Mm. And and when we're in a spot where people have choices about who they work for and how they work, that is not going to work because the two fundamental Human needs, once we get beyond food and shelter, some even say it's as important as food and shelter, belonging and significance. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and they want to know their part matters. So instead of you are a cog in my money machine, the better messaging to your people is, here's how we make a difference, and here's why your role matters. So it used to be, I think there was a study maybe 10 years ago that... um comp and commissions was actually like number four for for most sellers Mm. and i'm wondering this is a good kind of uh segue into where i wanted to go next in that the implications for this in today's talent market and i wonder i don't have any data to support this but i wonder where uh, the traditional values Mm. of income exist now in in not only in today's market that includes all uh 
sector, you know, all types of people, but specifically more so the, the younger generation. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering, what, what do you say about using this as a filter with this latest and greatest generation of sellers that really are just, I mean, they're, they're wired unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, the important thing you need to understand is, and I want to get this on the table, the comp matters. So the comp matters. Go look at school teachers. That's why they're all leaving. The comp matters. Yeah. And, and, the, and the comp right now for, for sellers, just for every, I want to put this on the record, yeah. is you don't get to, con- companies listening, you don't get to control the market. You can say you want to pay 60. You can say you want to pay 100. The comp is just fundamentally higher than it's ever been. And if you want good sellers, you got to spend the money. You got to spend the money. So no one... No one should, just as no one should have to go sacrifice financial security to be a school teacher, um, don't get me started, uh, no one is going to take a lower salary to sell for you. And they shouldn't have to. That's not where you want to start. And And you shouldn't make it about purpose. You shouldn't use that in a negative leverage way to get them to do that. What the purpose does is when you're paying a competitive salary, and I'm a believer in commission sales too, more sales, more money like that. But when you are competitive, what the purpose does is it differentiates you. Mm. When your sellers have a choice about where to work, it attracts the best talent and it keeps them. It further inoculates you against them just leaving for $5,000 somewhere else. And so the thing that you need to understand, there is data on this. So I'm going to share three data points with you that are crucial. Number one, the research is clear. Purpose-driven companies outperform the market by over 350%. Number two, purpose-driven companies get more customer advocacy than companies that are just organized around the financials. Why? Customers can tell the difference. You got one team sitting in a room saying, how can we make more money? You got another team sitting in a room saying, how can we do something cool for our customers? That second team is going to produce more revenue, 350%, and they are going to have better customer advocacy. But now here's the third thing, and this is so important for salespeople. Recent study from Dr. Valerie Good at Michigan State University revealed sellers with a sense of purpose bigger than money have greater resilience and greater tenacity. And here's why. We human beings are at our best when we know someone else is counting on us. And if I'm a seller and all I'm doing is waking up every day trying to hit my own number, trying to, you know, make a living. And making a living for your family is a noble endeavor. Don't get me wrong. But if it's all about me and things get hard and customers are hard to reach and we have a product malfunction and the competition comes out with something better and I'm sick of doing Zoom calls all day on my kitchen island. If all that happens and it's just about me, a certain point, I'm done. But if I know that what I'm doing matters, I'm going to rally. And and, uh, what a purpose will do, it is as steadfast and it's shared. And what that sense of purpose will do for you is it will increase your resilience, it'll increase your tenacity. And if you're not totally burnt out, yes, you need to get a good night's sleep, yes, you need to do all that, it will also increase your joy in your job. Mm. So, how have you taken, because it sounds like you've used some of this data to maybe inform uh, another study or a series of studies more specific for leadership. Yeah. So here's what we realized. So I spent many years as a sales trainer and I ran a number of sales training programs, studied salespeople, and it was all in search of the holy grail. What differentiates the top salespeople? And what we found was it was this sense of noble purpose. So we started doing sales training on that. Well, what I found was that mattered and that was important, but it was the sales leaders. The Mm. sales leaders are the force multiplier. So if I've got a top performer and I train them in purpose-driven selling, they'll hold on to that, even if their sales leader is very transactional. But that middle of the bell curve, the average person, they won't. (laughs) It's just too hard. And so what we realized is we needed to train sales leaders in a completely different conversation. And we needed to add on top of all those transactional things they were doing. We had to actually train sales leaders to be belief builders. And what we found 
was when we are the new work that we've done over the past couple of years, when we changed the conversation that sales leaders are having with their sellers, it changes the conversation sellers are having with their customers. What needs to change about those conversations? Like, like give me some, some talking points for a sales leader that I can, if I can walk away, I can say, these, these are the things I need to be talking about. Number one, game changing question. Single most important thing. Asking the question, how will the customer be different as a result of doing business with us? Asking that when you got a new product offering, how will this improve life for our customers? And dig deep, get specific. We got a chapter in the book called Specificity is Sexy, because it is. So dig deep on that, ask it in sales meetings, ask it when you're doing deal reviews. Second thing you can do, I'm only gonna tell you two things to do, because you're sales manager and I know you're ADHD like I am. So the second thing you can do is tell customer impact stories. And I know storytelling has been talked a lot about uh, over the years, you've got a background in that. In sales, we tend to tell two kinds of stories. One kind of story is the win story. Nigel closed the deal, Nigel is a rock star, look at him, he went in at the 11th hour, close it. Those are great stories. We also tell use case stories. The customer used XYZ, those are good stories because it shows people how the product is being used. A customer impact story is different. It's not about your offering and it's your seller's not the hero. A customer impact story is about how you made a difference in the life of a customer. So it's about not, here's all the specifics of our IT, it's the customer got home at night at a reasonable hour. The customer uh, wasn't coming in, hair on fire, first of the month every year. You know? So as a, as a sales manager, when you start asking, how will the customer be different? And then you start telling stories. Let me tell you about a customer and how their whole life was changed, how their business was changed, how whatever happened. That's you building belief with your team. So if you do those two things as a sales leader, super practical, you can start today, you'll start to change the emotional center. And where you want the emotional center of your sales team is around making a difference to customers. And it doesn't make you less assertive. It actually makes them more assertive because they know it counts. So let's go one step higher. <laughs> I know where we're going with this. <laughs> Lisa, I am <clears throat> I need a sales leader. How do I how do I pull this out in an interview? How do I mm -hmm. ask the right questions? How do I mm -hmm. give me some certainty in a world where sales leaders come and go like the wind? Mm -hmm. How do I find this in a candidate? One question. Tell me about a time when you made a difference at work. Mm. Ask that question. Now, if they're a sales leader, they're probably going to tell you, well, we had this big number and here's how I made it. And, and that's fine because that's how they've all been trained. I was one of them. Say, dig a little deeper for me. Tell me about a time, maybe something more personal where you as a human made a difference to someone at work. And the right candidate will go, oh, well, I hadn't thought about this way, but this, I don't know, what's coming to my mind is this one time when one of my colleagues really was going through a rough time and I told him I'd take his calls the next day and it meant the world to him because he could go off and be with his kids. Like that's what you're looking for. Because I'm assuming if you're looking for a sales leader, you know how to vet them on do you know how to train a team? Do you know how to work a comp play? You, like, you got all that. We're going for that one level deeper. And that's the question. Tell me about a time when you made a difference to someone at work. That will tell you if they're hardwired for a sense of purpose. Mm. That's the tell. And push a little because they're going to answer with what they think you want. Yeah. But push a little and see if the orientation is to self or to the other. You know, if they, if they give you some big hero story about how wonderful they are, they could be nervous, they're in an interview, say, well, how did that impact the other person? That's, that's, the, that's the secret sauce you're looking for. Got it. Okay, so everybody has to read Selling with Noble Purpose. If you don't, I don't know where you've been for the past decade. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, there's this whole new 
wave of folks that don't read. So, and I'm fine. I'm with that. As long as you're learning, that's okay. You've got like 30 something LinkedIn learning courses. Where do I, I start? Where do I start? Right. I'm not going to read the book. I know it. I'm just not going to do it. So where do I go? Purpose driven sales on LinkedIn, okay. on LinkedIn learning, watch purpose driven sales. I will tell you, um, I know my own reading habits have changed somewhat. And someone said to me once, a guy who's a, a book coach, he said, do you know that the studies show that if you buy a book, you just look at it on Amazon, you buy it, and you just open up and skim the table of contents, you've gotten something. And I was so relieved by that because I buy so many books and don't finish them. And I was like, okay, maybe not as much as if I read half of it. Um, but I'll also tell you, we wrote the new book in shorter chapters with uh, pictures and um, for the ADD reader. Having said that, if a book is not your thing, um, Purpose Driven Sales on LinkedIn. It's a course that we have on LinkedIn Learning, and that is a great jumping off point for people. So if I want to have you come talk to my team, talk to my sales leaders, follow you, like where, where do I go to, to learn from you? Uh, find me on LinkedIn is probably the easiest thing. Uh, if you want to look at our website and look at some of our offerings, just Google Selling with Noble Purpose and you'll find me. Our website will pop right up. But that I appreciate you asking that because I am doing a lot of programs now with sales leadership teams, and I'm also doing a lot of backstage executive coaching with chief revenue officers. Got it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. It's been a long uh, anticipated pleasure for me, so I'm glad <laughs> I got a chance to pin you down and, and have a chat with you. It was so great. and and. When you said you were a fanboy, I never dreamed I would have fanboys. You got oh, one here in Kentucky. I'm a middle-aged sales coach, so that's very exciting for me. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks. Music from this episode is from my good buddy, Justin Adams. You can listen to Justin's music at Spotify or Apple Music. Thank you, Justin, for the music. And thank you for checking out another episode of The Revenue Harvest.